Our next section here is going to talk a little bit about strategies for starting medications in the geriatric population, and we'll start to talk some about specific psychotropic medication classes. And we'll start off first talking about SSRIs and SNRIs, two of our most common antidepressant classes. So the common mantra of geriatric prescribing is start low, go slow, don't stop, and be patient. And what that means is generally we start low, meaning that the starting dose of typical psychotropics are going to be about a quarter to half of the usual starting dose of that for younger adults. So I might give the example here of a medication like escitalopram. So in a general adult, folks might at times start a dose of 5 milligrams, and an older adult, we're generally going to start with 2.5 milligrams and then titrate upwards. The next is go slow. So we really want to be cautious and slow with these increases in medication dose and make sure to increase them on a regular interval. The other important thing is don't stop. And so even though older adults might be more sensitive to some of the medication side effects, many will still need roughly the same therapeutic dose range as younger adults. So make sure to continue to titrate up to effectiveness and don't be afraid to get people to a therapeutic dose. And lastly, be patient, especially in the setting of antidepressants. These medications can really take upwards to 8 to 12 weeks to be fully effective. When we look at large randomized controlled trials, such as the STAR-D treatment trial, many patients continued to see improvements with these medications at 8 to 12 weeks. Other strategies for starting medications in the geriatric population, it's really important to explain the anticipated time to benefit of these medications so that patients don't become frustrated. You know, I think what can be a common occurrence in clinic is that you'll start a patient on a medication like an antidepressant, they'll take the medication for a few weeks, and then at the follow-up visit a few months later, we'll tell you that they discontinued the medication because they didn't see a benefit. So really being upfront and explaining sometimes the time lag between starting treatment and when to anticipate a potential benefit can really be helpful in improving adherence. It's also important to provide some psychoeducation and discussion of coping skills and strategies to behaviorally manage symptoms as patients are waiting for these medications to kick in. So what are the mindfulness practices that they can do? What are deep breathing? What are kind of other behavioral strategies that they can engage in? You know, being active, getting physical exercise. What are the things that they can start doing as they wait for the medications to kick in? Also, referrals to psychotherapy, both group and individual, can be very helpful in bolstering those coping skills and strategies as medications are starting to work. In general, for older adults, I'm rarely using other medications such as benzodiazepine, hydroxyzine, or gabapentinoids to bridge patients until antidepressants start working unless absolutely necessary. However, some notable exceptions to that, if patients have a severe psychotic or anxious depression, sometimes these medications are necessary to help bridge until antidepressants are effective. So let's start diving into some of the major psychotropic medication classes, and we'll start first with antidepressants. So the first group that we'll talk about are the SSRIs, or the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And these medications really work by blocking reuptake of serotonin. In general, these medications are first-line treatment for depression and anxiety. These medications are generally safer in overdose than other antidepressant medication classes. And some common side effects to think about in general, and in particular with older adults. So GI or gastrointestinal side effects such as nausea, diarrhea, upset stomach, these symptoms are going to be the most common that we see with this medication class. Generally, I will tell folks to take these medications with food. Oftentimes, these side effects can be transient. Headaches can be another common side effect that patients can experience, as well as sexual side effects. And I think sometimes there's a stigma amongst older adults that sexual health isn't as important. It's always important to ask about it at follow-up, as some folks might not feel comfortable kind of endorsing these symptoms. We sometimes talk about this early activation syndrome or a slight increase in anxiety when first starting the medication. Often that can be transient. Hyponatremia is another side effect that, that we think about, especially in older adults. 
in general, I will only check sodium levels in patients with known hyponatremia or patients who become confused after starting an antidepressant. I will generally look back and I like to see at least some measure of kind of a basic or comprehensive metabolic panel within the last year to make sure that folks have a normal sodium level. It's also important to know that SSRIs all have antiplatelet effects. So these medications can act synergistically with other medications that increase bleeding risk. So for instance, if patients are on nonsteroidals, aspirin, or warfarin. And so for patients who are on warfarin, it's very important to let their primary care doctor or anticoagulation clinic know, as it may change the frequency needed for their blood monitoring. There's also some effects on bone metabolism and an increased risk of falls that's been associated with antidepressants in general. This risk really tends to be most about around when patients are first started on a medication, as well as when there's dose adjustments. Sometimes patients can say that they feel a little bit tired or they have some insomnia when starting treatment and also weight gain, although that tends to be a relatively small amount of weight per year. And doing behavioral strategies like exercise, kind of diet, those things can help mitigate some of those side effects. Sertraline, citalopram, and escitalopram are probably the three most common antidepressants prescribed to older adults for depression and anxiety. Sertraline is often used as kind of a first-line treatment. Generally, we'll be starting older adults at a dose of 12.5 or 25 milligrams and then move upwards to kind of titrate and reach an effective dose. Citalopram used to be the most widely prescribed antidepressant in the United States. However, in 2011, there was an FDA warning that specifically came out regarding citalopram, and that showed that high doses of citalopram was associated with a dose-dependent increase in the QT interval. Following that time, a lot of prescribers stopped prescribing citalopram first line. It has very limited drug-drug interactions and can be a very safe medication. The FDA warning said that for general adults, the maximum dose should be 40 milligrams, and for older adults, the maximum dose of citalopram should be 20 milligrams. This was a medication that previously was being used in much higher dose ranges, like 60, 80, 120 milligrams. So that really limited the dose escalation. The FDA also recommended periodic EKG monitoring. Escitalopram is just the enantomer of citalopram. And interestingly enough, did not get tagged with the FDA warning for QT prolongation in the United States. However, it did so in Europe and in Canada. This medication can also cause dose-dependent increases in the QT interval, but at a lesser degree than citalopram. Again, for patients starting on escitalopram, just given the QT prolonging potential, I generally recommend a baseline EKG if they haven't had one done in the last one to two years. And if I'm increasing above 20 milligrams, I will generally check an EKG as well just to make sure. So paroxetine, this is a antidepressant that we really avoid using in older adults. And the reason for that is that paroxetine is the most anticholinergic of the SSRIs. And so how we talked about earlier, anticholinergic medications can really have significant side effects for older adults. So they can be associated with dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, as well as confusion. Also, this medication tends to have a lot more drug-drug interactions. It's both a substrate and an inhibitor at the cytochrome P450 2D6. It also has a very short half-life. So medications with a short half-life, if you stop it abruptly, people can get a really bad discontinuation syndrome. All that to say, if I have a patient who's maintained on paroxetine, they're doing very well, it's been very effective for their depression and anxiety, If they're not having cognitive symptoms or concerns about worsening memory, then I'll keep them on the medication and continue to use that medication. However, if folks are having any anticholinergic side effects or any changes in memory, I'm generally going to recommend changing to a different medication. Fluoxetine, this is a medication that gets used very often in general adults and also in children and adolescents. I tend to avoid it in our older adult population just given that it has a potent CYP2D6 inhibition. It also has a very long half-life, which can both be good and bad. 
So medications with a long half-life, if you miss a dose, it's okay. No discontinuation syndrome, which can be helpful if there's variable adherence. However, it tends to have more drug-drug interactions, and it's generally one I, I tend to avoid with older adults. Fluvoxamine is a medication that's also approved for obsessive compulsive disorder, and generally I'll restrict using that medication just for OCD. SSRI like medication, so we have trazodone, which generally we will be using for treatment of insomnia and to help folks get to sleep. The doses that are generally used for treatment of insomnia can range anywhere from you know, 25 to 150 or 200 milligrams. The doses used for depression treatment are generally higher, and folks often have a hard time tolerating the higher doses given that sedation effect. Shown here is a chart that puts together the results from several different studies showing the relative QT prolongation of various medications. And so in the left part of the graph here, we have some antipsychotics, so some first-generation and second-generation antipsychotics. On the second half, we have some of our antidepressant medications. And again, you can see medications like thyroidazine, zaprazidone. These are medications that can greatly prolong the QT interval. And then some of our antidepressant medications like citalopram and escitalopram shows that relative increase. Now let's talk a little bit about the SNRIs, or the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And the mechanism here is that these medications really work on both serotonin and norepinephrine blockade. Some of the common medications in this class include duloxetine, venlafaxine, and desvenlafaxine. So a couple things about these medications. All of these medications also have an indication for chronic pain. So a lot of times you will see these medications used for patients who have both depression as well as chronic pain, whether due to neuropathy or other kind of nerve pain. These medications tend to be more activating. Because of that, we usually want to dose these medications in the morning. If people are taking the medication too late into the afternoon or evening, it can actually disrupt sleep. These medications also tend to have a relatively short half-life, especially with venlafaxine, even the extended release versions. So if people accidentally miss a dose or two of the medication or abruptly stop it, people can get really bad withdrawal symptoms. Also related to that norepi effect, there can really be increases in blood pressure, and that's something that I monitor as well when starting these medications, and in particular, increases in diastolic blood pressure. Just a couple things to mention. So duloxetine and desvenlafaxine, these are medications that right at the starting dose of the medication, you get both that dual serotonin and norepinephrine effect. Venlafaxine is a medication that at lower doses of the medication, like 75 or 150 milligrams, it's really predominantly just working on serotonin reuptake. And you really need to dose the medication higher to doses above 150 or 225 to get both that serotonin or epinephrine effect. So key points for this section. So the common mantra of geriatric prescribing is start low, go slow, don't stop, and be patient. SSRIs are the first-line treatment for later-life depression and anxiety. The most common side effects of this class of medication include GI upset, headache, and sexual side effects. In particular, we generally avoid use of paroxetine in older adults, given the anticholinergic properties. SNRIs have indications for treatment of chronic pain as well as depression and anxiety. Common side effects include activation, increase in blood pressure, and withdrawal symptoms when medications are stopped abruptly.